All right, going for a live stream. Actually, I'm going to talk about utility tonight. I'm testing out the issue that I was having earlier with the live stream. Let's see if we can keep this in the green uh, without having this cycle as it was earlier, cycling uh, green, red, yellow, green, red, yellow. Let's see how this, uh, this works out. Hopefully, we're not going to have the same disruption that we had this morning. Um, I want to make sure that the uh, live stream is going to be solid for Monday, uh, Monday evening. So um, let's see if we get anyone to join in. XRP Carolina, what's up? Hey, good to see you on. Um, going through, I'm going to do a full live stream uh, tonight. We're going to talk about utility. I had a bunch of stuff prepared uh, this morning. Uh, wanted to get to it. <clears throat> we didn't really get uh, through all of uh, what I had planned on talking about. And I was running into some uh, technical difficulty uh, as part of the process. So um, I figured that uh, since I've got a great uh, live stream coming up on Monday night uh, with DNI, um, I should go through and run a solid, uh, a solid live stream tonight. Uh, make sure that we're not having the same type of lag issues um, that I had earlier this morning. So. And I actually, like I said, I had a bunch of stuff that I wanted to cover earlier, um, but was not able to get to. So uh, bear with me as I as I pull this all together. Uh, for some reason, OBS um, earlier this morning was cycling uh, green, red, yellow constantly, just nonstop. Uh, right now, it's looking a good solid green. I've only dropped about 400 frames, uh, which actually I think is uh, pretty good. So let's see if we can get a few more. Uh, people in and, and we'll start kicking it off tonight. Um, hope everybody had a uh, wonderful uh, Saturday. Um, looking forward to a great Sunday. Uh, have you have you guys ever heard of uh, the World Run? Uh, the World Run actually takes place uh, globally. Um, it starts in different parts of the world uh, exactly at the same time. Uh, so we have uh, we have a run starting here at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning um, and then it's going to be uh, in different parts of the world what's amazing about the world run um, is that as you're running they have a pace car uh, that starts out I believe the pace car starts out about 20 30 minutes into the run what's up Richter how you doing um, and so after uh, your run starts uh, you start getting going run as far as you can possibly run until you get timed out by the pace car so it's pretty much all over the world take a look look it up look up world run uh it's it supports uh spinal uh research um and it's pretty it's pretty amazing i've never done it live before uh so tomorrow will be the first time that i actually get out there and run it uh live in terms of live with a, a large group an organized group normally i'm just running with the app so uh, 7 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time. Uh, it also runs, I think it's 11 a.m. UTC. I forget exactly what it is, um, but I think it's going to be uh, absolutely, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So check it out. You can So you can run with the app. If you download the World Run app, um, yeah, it's really, really cool. So pretty much every year I've downloaded, I have the app registered through the app. You can register through tomorrow. Um, but again, it starts at 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, but it's it's really cool. It's really cool. So what happens is that if you're running with the app, there's a virtual pace car uh, that will catch up to you, and you'll get timed out by the virtual uh, pace car uh, when it catches you. Um, so, and then if you turn into uh, tune into uh, Red Bull TV, um, you can actually catch the world run on Red Bull TV. So it's pretty cool. Um, let's see what does uh, Leonard say here. Um, the fact that all these XRP videos need to justify why the price hasn't moved is a big red flag. I see further downside to XRP despite the news. I sold my stack for EOS. All right, um, you know, keep us uh, keep us posted on there. Um, I like to look at it from a terms of if you're diversifying, that's awesome. Um, you know, you everything is a, a long term uh, approach, even with uh, EOC or EOS. Uh, BTC, LTC, ETH, whatever you want to uh, put it in, in whichever terms, uh, it's all relatively speculative. 
Um, but when it comes to XRP, it is one of the only that is currently uh, that currently has a, a world uh, real world utility uh, that you know that's actually being uh, put into uh, play as we speak. So whether that's through the RippleNet uh, X Rapid solution or uh, even what we're seeing now with Coil and the XRP tip bots. So um, you might want to take a look at that. And it is true, uh, XRP has stayed relatively uh, stable and consistent uh, regardless of the, the ups and downs. You have minor moves. Uh, it's not being impacted uh, by the market news as a whole, um, but it is tied to overall utility. And that's uh, kind of what we want to talk about tonight and get into uh, utility uh, overall. So hey, if you guys could... Uh, uh, tweet this out. I'm gonna send out a quick tweet uh, on this uh, on the video. Let me uh, let me see if I can get this out real quick. I just want to tweet it out. Um, this normally I'm not streaming on uh, on Saturday nights. Um, let's see if I can do. Uh, let's see if we can do uh, just mainstream adoption utility. Uh, I'm gonna say live now. I'm just gonna throw this up on on Twitter real quick, uh, and then we can get to it on uh, now. What time is it? Is it 9? 9 p.m. 9 p.m. 5-4 Eastern Time. 5-4-19. Just in case uh, people look and say, hey, that's not, that's not accurate. Um, okay, so anyhow, let me log in and tweet that out. That should be going out here. Awesome. Okay, perfect. I sent that tweet out. And let's, uh, let's, let's get into this. So didn't really anticipate a, a huge crowd tonight, but... Uh, let me know, you know, if you guys see any kind of lag, any anything here. If you want to talk about anything specific, uh, that'd be great. Um, I just want to make sure uh, all the settings are are solid. I was having some uh, technical uh, issues on the live stream earlier this morning. So um, now, when we when we talk about utility, uh, this is really uh, important, you know. So really market as a whole and this goes back to and i mentioned this a couple times on the, on the stream that uh the ceo of coinbase had mentioned that we're moving from an overall investment period to a a, ter, a, a period of utility uh meaning that this the transition is critical uh and so a transition into utility also will bring about uh, more mainstream adoption through utility you get more mainstream recognition of what the digital asset space really is what digital assets are uh through more mainstream recognition um it's at that point that you're also going to get uh more investment in um and you'll start seeing also a trend in, in price movement uh in my opinion so uh so that's so that's going to be important um, now, as we discuss uh, utility and we really go through that, um, it's interesting to really stay uh, in tuned with what the market as a whole is identifying or uh, thinking about uh, blockchain, thinking about digital asset. Um, obviously, uh, Ripple and RippleNet have made, <clears throat> have made huge waves in the marketplace, in the banking industry. Um, and there was actually an interesting article that came out on Bloomberg. And, and it, this is a good starting point uh, for tonight's uh, topic and tonight's conversation as we're talking about utility. Um, because in this article on Bloomberg, it was, a re, it was referring to technology. The article was written by Doug Alexander. Um, the title of this article, Central Banks Use Blockchain for the First Time to Swap Currency. Now, it might be accurate to say that it's central banks that were using blockchain for the first time, but it is for sure not uh, the first time that banks in general uh, have used uh, blockchain or digital assets uh, to swap currency. Um, so I think that you know it, it's a, it's an accurate statement, yet an inaccurate statement filled with a little bit of misinformation. Um, and as you drill down into the article, and the reason why I bring this up is because we're beginning to see uh, the larger uh, financial entities uh, beginning to discuss and test and use, uh, even though it might be in a sandbox mode, uh, they are beginning to utilize blockchain in the cross-border payment uh, space in the exchange of currency space. Um, so that 
first and foremost is an important, uh, really it's an important move uh, in the right direction, in the direction that we want to see uh, as it relates to um, utility uh, and mainstream adoption. So now in this article, uh, the two entities are uh, the Bank of Canada and the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Those two are utilizing blockchain technology. They, in the article, again, it states it was the first trial between central banks. Okay, so it may be central banks. However, again, it's not the first time. Now, what's wrong with this article, there's a pro and con here. Uh, what's wrong with this is that not once do they mention the fact that since 2012, uh, Ripple through RippleNet or even what R3 is doing. They're not bringing up uh, the initiatives of R3 uh, when it comes to cross-border payments. The statement through this Bloomberg article really makes it look like uh, this is a new project uh, that really hasn't uh, that really hasn't uh, started yet in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and then the focus here as you go down is who did the test. Uh, so the initial test is Project Jasper is the name of it, was linked up. Uh, so, it, uh, so you have the Bank of Canada's Experimental Domestic Payment Network, Project Jasper, was linked up with Singapore's Project Ubin Network as part of the test. Now, this is what's interesting, done in partnership with Accenture and J.P. Morgan, Chase & Co. So as we know with J.P. Morgan, uh, JP Morgan uh, through and with Jamie Dimon hasn't been the most friendly uh, when it comes to uh, blockchain technology or uh, you know even even digital asset uh, in the cross-border space uh, in terms of uh, converse you know in terms of what we've heard uh, in the media so now that we really can identify that uh, let me see if you're are you are you in the picture you want to be on let's see oh wait there we go Oh, you know what? That, that there you go. See, right there. Yeah, you're right there. Awesome. Subscribe. To it. Subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe and like and, like and turn, on. turn on notifications. <laughs> That's <Bye>. right. Bye bye. <laughs> so not I'm not ending it yet. No. <laughs> All right. So. So let's see, where were we? All right, let's get back to, so this article, again, bringing uh, some light into uh, mainstream uh, and mainstream utility, uh, mainstream uh, recognition of blockchain, mainstream recognition of uh, digital asset. Um, so what, what's the issue with the article? Again, uh, and I'll, I'll move on from this, is the fact that it's, the test is done in partnership with JP Morgan. So here's JP Morgan, which is beginning to build some momentum into the digital asset cross border uh, payment space or in the cross border payment space utilizing uh, blockchain uh, technology. So now to me, you know, competition is good. Um, it's, it's healthy. Uh, it proves the case. Uh, they're definitely seeing uh, a proof in the case. Uh, that this is definitely functional. Uh, and, and right here, there, there was a statement uh, from the FinTech officer uh, at MAS. Uh, and let's see, let me pull up this, uh, this quote. And that's the Monetary Authority of Singapore, MAS. Uh, here we go. Okay. So his quote was, Project Jasper and Project Ubin have built on previous innovations in the payments area to demonstrate that cross-border payment and settlement can be made simpler and more efficient. So, you know, where have we heard this together uh, uh, before? You know, obviously we've heard that uh, making uh, cross-border payment and settlement easier, uh, more efficient. This is something, again, that we've seen uh, being done through RippleNet, uh, through the RippleNet solution, Ripple's RippleNet solution, as well as uh, some of the things that R3 had been working on. Uh, now, uh, Scott Hendry of Bank of Canada uh, had stated here, he said, only through continued collaboration and fundamental research will it be possible for this technology to mature and for policymakers to fully understand its potential. Now, again, if we were living in a vacuum, if we are living in, in a time where we didn't realize that this kind of technology already existed and had been utilized, we'd say, you know, that's pretty amazing that they're actually doing this, you know, but, um, you know, but, but that's, uh, but, you know, that's interesting, you know. So anyhow, let's see, uh, Carolina says, anybody else in the chat? Uh, we do have some people on. So look, Dan Ski just uh, popped in. Uh, glad to see you there. Uh, Tabline. Uh, 
is is also in that's great uh glad uh, um glad glad he's in too uh tap line was on earlier i don't know if you guys were on the live stream earlier this morning uh we got a little bit more involved in international politics and then there was a ton of stuff that i wanted to talk about regarding uh, mainstream adoption and utility kind of carrying over also uh from the theme of uh conversation uh earlier on so uh, well, from a few uh, streams ago, but let's see again, you know, for tonight, tonight I was I'm going through and trying to do a, a live stream test. Not sure how many people are going to join in right now. We've got uh, 12 people in the room uh, watching. So that's great. Uh, you guys can definitely participate. Um, I want to make sure we can go through and my settings are are solid. Okay, right now we have 15 watching. So if you guys want to try to uh, tweet it out, get a few more people in the room, that'd be great. Um, I sent a, a couple of tweets out that I'd be uh, live streaming uh, right now. Um, and and so, you know, got a lot of uh, great things to cover uh, regarding uh, utility and main uh, mainstream adoption. So there's a lot of little pieces that have occurred really over the past week or so that we're going to piece together tonight. So if you guys got any scotch or whiskey, it's definitely a uh, whiskey night tonight. So. <laughs> tap line yes you started and you are uh ending the day that's definitely that could definitely be an issue <laughs> but i totally appreciate the fact that you are starting the day and ending the day uh on the live stream so i know i was not on the live stream all day so um but glad uh, glad to have you on again uh guinness awesome and i had uh, guinness earlier this afternoon we went to i uh, started the day at tennis and then um tennis to lunch and from lunch we went to the uh uh trampoline place with the kids and fortunately at the trampoline place they have a bar last week we were there and they ended their two for one so could you imagine the devastation when we got there you know and we're there because you know the parents want to sit around and have fun too and then you realize that the two for one that we anticipated was was ended and then we went back today expecting only getting one and asked them and they said no actually we uh, reinstituted the two for one. So we said, that's good news. That means we'll be back again next week. <laughs> so, and I had two Guinness over there. So uh, Guinness is uh, definitely one of my favorite. Hey, uh, Brian uh, Dark, <laughs> Brian Darcy, what's up? Glad to see you on. Uh, you're living in a rocket. That's great. That means you're just waiting, waiting on standby mode. So we're getting ready to moon at some point. Uh, it could be, could be this year. It could be five years from now. So, so mainstream, mainstream adoption. Um, so uh, veteran owned, man, great to see you on here. Uh, glad you made it in. Tonight, we're going to really uh, get into, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about mainstream adoption and uh, utility. So let's see, Guinness and Blue Moon, a black and blue. You know, I haven't tried that before. I've tried, uh, Others, I've you know, I've tried the blacksmith, that's Guinness and Smittix, uh, Snakebite, um, but I don't think I've tried the Guinness and Blue Moon. I'll have to try that out, see how that is. Um, all right, so so we're just going through uh, the fact that there's a little FUD, a little FOMO, a little FUD, little positive news, a uh, little uh, mainstream adoption uh, with two banks, Bank of Canada and the Monetary Authority of Singapore. But with that in the article, um, Bloomberg, they kind of failed to mention the fact that a lot of this uh, test has been going on now and utility, actual hands-on utility, even with X Rapid already rolling out X Current, already being used, R3's uh, solutions. Uh, so the cross-border payment space uh, isn't necessarily brand new as the article is trying to make it sound with a partnership with JP Morgan. So, all right. But but let's move on from there. I think it's it's important news. I think it's good for the space, uh, even though the article seemed to meant, uh, fail to mention uh, those that have already been in the space. Um, so from there, let's let's move on. And and this is uh, uh, I actually no. Let me skip this one. This one was uh, John McAfee, and he's talking about the Bitcoin price. We can talk about that in a little bit because I want to go into more mainstream adoption. And there were two specific articles that came out this week uh that are 
very important uh, when it comes to mainstream adoption, very important when it comes to overall utility and recognition of this space. So we know that uh, NASDAQ had, had listed, uh, had listed uh, uh, Bitcoin and listed uh, Ethereum uh, previously. Uh, and so we're talking about the, the index, the cryptocurrency index uh, for uh, Bitcoin and for Ethereum. Now, uh, NASDAQ is actually adding XRP uh, to uh, their cryptocurrency index. So this is definitely a major uh, transition. This means they're adding more and more, uh, be really gaining real recognition that this space is moving in the right direction. And these are players that wouldn't add something like this and jeopardize uh, reputation at this point if they didn't believe that this was uh, growing into a much uh, bigger uh, product uh, that's going to go mainstream. And the fact that they're bringing it into their index is going to also then provide the mainstream recognition. Now, this is interesting also because we have NASDAQ, and this is an article that, that I'm pulling from was, let's say, on Coindesk, April 30th. Now, this is also through a partnership with uh, New Zealand-based uh, blockchain data and research firm uh, Brave New Coin uh, that's going to offer real-time index information for XRP, and it already started as of May uh, 1st. So this is a trend in the right direction, uh, and so we're definitely seeing uh, positive signs, again, of uh, mainstream adoption through mainstream adoption we're going to begin to see more uh, positive signs of uh, hands-on utility because at the end of the day uh, that's what we want to be able to see so uh, let's see here uh, who just jumped in gxrp what's up glad to see you on it is all about the utility um coil fantastic uh glad that you're uh using uh using coil uh, if you guys haven't registered uh, for Coil yet, go ahead and go to Coil.com, uh, get signed up with Coil. Um, and then when you are on Coil, if you want to find other users, I guess you need to, to know their names. Uh, but let me type in mine as a starting point so you get an idea of how it, it they don't have a search bar or any, any search, uh, uh, there's no mechanism for searching, uh, I should say. So let me kind of talk and type at the same time isn't working for me um but anyhow so this is when you go on to on to uh on to coil you go to coil.com slash you slash whatever the person's registered name is on coil and mine in this case is hodl report h-o-d-l-r-e-p-o-r-t so um so that's awesome go ahead and, and check that out um let's see dan ski heard about the xrplx uh was added uh you didn't look for it yet yeah, i haven't really looked it up uh uh, to see what's going on on the NASDAQ index, uh, the cryptocurrency index. Uh, but again, I think it's an important initiative that it's moving that way. Let's see, Tapline. I work with RIA Euronet, and in Poland, they're as well known as Coca Cola. Uh, who are we referring to? Are we talking about R RIA or um, who's as well known as Coke in Poland? Which, uh, what are we referring to there, uh, Tapline? Brian uh, Darcy, Jeff, what was the story today with BitPay XRP up to? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I I missed that altogether. I didn't even see that news. Um, but I will look it up and report back. Um, so I'm not not 100 sure uh, what that's all about. So yeah, definitely uh, RIA. Uh, Kelly Slade, what's up? Good to see you on tonight. All right, so so now we're you know we're seeing the the recognition of uh, of the of Na or we're seeing Nasdaq's recognition of uh, another uh, addition to their cryptocurrency index. Again, that's XRP. Now, if we go a step further, um, let's see if it wasn't in this article. Oh, by the way, uh, May thirteenth through May fifteenth is consensus in New York. Uh, there is some anticipation. Uh, that uh, the Warren Davidson team, Congressman Warren Davidson, will be making some rollout announcements uh, at consensus uh, over that weekend, over May 13th through the 15th uh, in, in New York. So go ahead and check it out online, consensus, uh, and, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit 
um, on on Monday's stream as well. But there's a ton of uh, advertising on this uh, on this site that I'm looking at. So now, if we go into a little bit further um, here, okay, next level. This is okay. So this is interesting too. So now we have uh, who was it? Um, let's see. Next level, CNBC. Africa's crypto trader will begin broadcasting from the Nasdaq studio. Now, this person is Ran uh, Nooner, uh, and he's the host of the show. Let's see, he tweeted uh, that it's going to launch. This is May 9th uh, from Times Square. So this is crazy. CNBC, so we're, it's going to be all about uh, the discussion of crypto trading. And this is uh, from the Nasdaq studio. So they're taking it to the next level. So we know that they've, they're adding... Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP index uh, to the uh, to their well, the overall to Nasdaq's cryptocurrency index. Um, now in the at the Nasdaq Studio, they're actually bringing over uh, again Africa's crypto trader to broadcast starting May 9th, and it's going to launch from Times Square. Um, and it says here the Nasdaq Studio is in the middle of all the action and could be visible to tons of people passing by on their way to and from work. Uh, not to mention tourists. So that's pretty cool. Putting crypto right into the heart of Manhattan. So again, I, like I said, taking this to a whole new level, what we're seeing is a, a full, uh, not necessarily adoption yet, but we're seeing the full embracing of uh, this uh, technology or this revolutionary uh, uh, financial uh, class, this new asset class uh, by, uh, by NASDAQ. Uh, they're pushing it into the mainstream. They're helping get it there. So, so so far, we've seen a lot of the grassroots efforts. We've seen the early adopters. We've seen the content providers. We've seen the content sharers. Um, and now, uh, to be able to see NASDAQ uh, taking uh, the candle and really, you know, pushing it, uh, pushing it out there is pretty cool. Uh, in this article, now this article was on CCN. Uh, when did it show up here? uh actually uh yesterday there's an article from yesterday and i like what they say here because i agree with this um the timing of the move is surely no accident uh bitcoin bulls are back and institutional investors investors are now beginning to dip their toes into the crypto waters so how cool is that now there was also at the exact same time there was a survey that fidelity published and the survey was about how many uh how many people how many people how many hedge funds uh pension funds family offices are actually invested into uh crypto and what they found was that more than 20 percent of institutional investors are, are already have some exposure to digital assets 20 percent of institutional investors um so that is pretty amazing and these are allocations according to the article that were made since 2016 so three years so for for them to make this acknowledgement already now this is going to be public an uh, acknowledgement that 20 percent of institutional investors uh, are putting money into the digital asset space so that's phenomenal um, now the fact that as we see starting on Thursday on May 9th uh, we're going to see Nasdaq's uh, we're gonna see a show on on the Nasdaq broadcasting uh, so that's going to be very cool as well right out of the Nasdaq studio more mainstream adoption uh, more utility all right so let's see uh, tap line let's see XRP, uh, what's up, Miyagi? Glad you're on. That's awesome. Uh, let's see who we. Let's see how many people we've got on so far. Uh, let me pull this up. All right, we got 19 on for a uh, uh, spur of the moment uh, decision to throw up this live stream. Uh, did have a great live stream earlier this morning. I uh, want to make sure I had a little, a few technical glitches. Want to make sure everything's going great. Uh, we're gonna do a live stream on Monday. Uh, directly after DNI with DNI, I think we have a lot of things to discuss. So uh, you guys will, will really have a, a good time uh, on on the uh, on the chat Monday evening. So, all right, now let's uh, let's jump over from what's happening with Nasdaq, and let me throw this out there because this is I think also important. Um, there's still discussion over where the potential 
what the possibility of Bitcoin pricing can be as we roll through 2019, as we approach uh, 2020. Uh, and so this is something that John McAfee has thrown out there. Uh, he's doubling down or tripling down that Bitcoin's going to reach a million dollars by the end of the year. He's standing by it. Now, the thing is, he's not alone uh, with uh, big predictions uh, because we see others that have also uh, made some pretty uh, uh, large predictions when it comes to uh, where Bitcoin's going to be, whether it's going to be by 2020, as McAfee's saying, or um, as we've seen from Tim Draper, uh, he's said that the expectation of Bitcoin to hit a price of $250,000 uh, by 2022. So, and there's many others uh, that share that same uh, thought process in the space. And so it's interesting. I think it's important uh, to discuss, you know, mainly because uh, this is what's going to begin uh, to hit the mainstream. So right now, these kind of conversations are being reported on by CCN. But now imagine the fact that NASDAQ Studio is going to be uh, the airwaves are now going to be captured uh, by by a uh, crypto show by Africa's crypto trader and again broadcasting starting on May 9th uh, from NASDAQ studio so people that tune into NASDAQ studio are now going to or to the NASDAQ broadcast are now going to gain more exposure uh, to what's happening and so the fact that NASDAQ has also added again uh, to their cryptocurrency index we already know they added Bitcoin they're, they've added ETH and now they're adding or have added XRP as of uh, May 1st. I think a lot of these things are kind of tying together. As we see the news drop, um, I, I firmly believe that there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes. And they are also, when it comes to mainstream adoption, there's a certain uh, progression uh, that they want everything to go through. It doesn't help to dump everything suddenly. Um, they and, and you also have to see a preparation time of the different uh, entities whether it was an e-trade a fidelity or even a nasdaq so i think that's all important all right let's see uh let's see what kind of uh feedback we got over here let me just take a quick break here all right let's see <clears throat> let's go back up here awesome um okay tap line okay i wonder why the price is not moved with all the all the use i'm not uh i'm not hating just wanting your insight it's crazy uh do you think they are holding the price down until they are ready um uh, right now and i can't remember if someone said it i don't remember if i if i read it somewhere um through um but someone had discussed um moving from the mom and pop investment which are really all of us the early adopters to the large institutional uh movers and shakers um i think we saw you know uh, when we look back to the large run-up uh and the big speculative fomo bump that we saw uh end of 2017 going into beginning of 2018 there was a lot of fervor behind it we saw the news media picking it up we saw the news channels talking about it you saw cnbc all of the organizations were talking about the big run-up of bitcoin as it progressed up to twenty thousand. there was a ton of excitement and that's what they need excitement for their news viewership so now are they suppressing it i don't think that the big entities have been providing the uh, positive uh, news. Uh, so from that perspective, is has the uh, major media outlets been suppressing, uh, somewhat suppressing the pricing? I believe through their FUD articles and their FUD media, um, and maybe the lack thereof as well, uh, reporting anything positive, only reporting the negative, they're going to instinctively hold it down. The fact that now the institutional uh, investors are starting to gain a little more momentum it's going to become accepted on the mainstream level. Then we're going to start seeing a bump up uh, of volume uh, traded with a bump up of volume traded. I also, you know, you're going to naturally uh, see a bump up in price. Uh, and that, that just 
that's just what happens. You know, you're going to see more buy requests because you're going to start seeing a bump up of identifying um, on, on general media, uh, whether it's through NASDAQ or CNBC or, or, or you know, elsewhere. Um, that's a component of it. I think we're also seeing a, a slight separation of, of XRP if we want to focus in on XRP from the movements of BTC, pro or con. Uh, we're definitely seeing some positive movements. I also I do think it's a positive that we're beginning to see some form of stability, you know, over a period of time in the price points. It it never helps to see large spikes up, um, as we saw with that FOMO spike, because that's basically what it was, uh, with no real substance behind it. As everything settled down, we saw the big fall off as well. With the fall off, you get more FUD. Uh, piled onto it and you'll see a bigger fall off. Um, so you need a slow, gradual um, uh, build up. Obviously, then if there's some big uh, utility news, some big uh, momentum, you might see bigger spikes as it kind of uh, goes up uh, in, the, in that kind of a, an angle. Um, but we're looking for long term growth and stability uh, in this space. And I believe that the big institutional investors, they want the same thing. They don't want to see big spikes and big drops because they're going to put lots of money in um, they're, you know, they're going to be moving millions of dollars in where we might be putting thousands, hundreds, thousands or tens of thousands. They're putting, you know, millions, tens of millions or a uh, hundred of million, you know, whatever. Um, so they need to have some relative stability as they're moving money uh, into the space. So is there potential for uh, manipulation? Are they holding it down? I think it's definitely possible. Um, and I don't think it's so crazy to think about it that way either, uh, because we have seen and it's it's very obvious that there's a similar kind of manipulation when it comes to traditional stocks as well so um let's see what else we got here xrp carolina um i know that manipulation is happening but i don't know how or why uh, hopefully that that what we just talked about helps out a little bit uh we do know why to get all this crypto for cheap i agree with that also gxrp um let's see smash the likes that uh, thanks miyagi uh, sometimes i forget to talk about uh the like button that would be awesome uh throw up some uh, hit the hit the likes uh if you haven't subscribed you're new subscribe if you know anyone else that wants to subscribe make sure they subscribe forward it on whatever um get it out on twitter i think all that stuff helps out so kind of getting down the chats uh little by little um let's see here looking long term i agree that that's what's important um tom mullins and his wife had a great time uh what did i miss here oh let's see xrp oh okay all right let's uh let's go down here what's up johnny bull yo i saw that you were doing some uh some live streams uh last night and today uh glad you're able to uh to get some streams on there so let me show that there we go um all right let's see what we got here 350 you know what tap line i'm happy with 350 at this point too i'm happy with a dollar i'm happy with 30 cents right now because uh we can continue to accumulate uh to accumulate uh and keep adding uh, and same thing with some of the others if you're diversifying and adding you know you're into your portfolio uh from different uh from different uh, digital assets now is now is definitely a good time to uh to accumulate so uh, there's going to be accumulation periods and there's going to be sell off periods. So um, and to me, this is long term. You know, I'm putting money in that I'm anticipating thinking out, you know, two to five years beyond five years, you know, five to 10 year plan as well. So um, let's see here. Yes, definitely subscribe. Thanks, Carolina. Um, what's up, XRP Hollywood? Glad to see you on. It's awesome. So let's see. Let's see where we're at here uh okay let me go over here perfect all right so where where did we just leave off here we went through uh john mcafee okay here we go this is interesting because this was a chat that was on reddit uh about five days ago i don't have an exact date where's the date other than it says five days ago all right so it all started regarding stellar xlm the reason why i'm bringing this up i just think it's interesting the conversation is very relevant uh not just for stellar xlm but it's also relevant when we think about what ripple and xrp are doing um so let's let's look through this 
and and I just thought it was really interesting. There was something uh, as I drilled down uh, to really get into some of these comments that I thought were were very uh, pertinent. Um, and let me see if I can find it again. It was pretty long, and I had it pulled up, and then I kind of moved it. Um, let's see here. So th in this case, they were talking about uh, stellar uh, acquisition of chain. Um, also uh, seeing the uh, uh, a relationship potentially with uh, with Worldwire and Visa uh, being you know, and they were talking about is Stellar uh, becoming the backbone for future payment technology, uh, and so so really that that wasn't really the point of this. Let me drill down a little bit here. It says Visa working with Chain doesn't explicitly mean that Villa, uh, that Visa will be working on the public ledger. Uh, but let me see. Okay, here we go. This is what I was looking for. Someone had a really good explanation. Uh, so let's see. Let's see how this was. All right. So the question visa. We're, okay. They might as well be working on a clone of Stellar, a private one. Talking about visa. Let's see. Imagine. So somebody commented here. This void burn uh, comment. He said, "Imagine if there was one internet per country." So. I think there's a little bit out of out of whack uh so the way the way this conversation ended up going because it also was very relevant in terms of okay so what i was thinking here we go now i got my my thought process back back in order so visa working with chain doesn't explicitly mean that visa works on the public ledger they might as well be working on a clone of stellar or a private one now what i was also thinking is the same uh, can hold true for JPM with the uh, you know JP Morgan's JPM coin uh, creating their own private uh, coin or Bank of America or Bank of England whomever it might be you know this is still relevant because this person was saying that Visa might as well uh, create their other their own instead of utilizing Stellar just as many others could potentially create their own instead of utilizing xrp or utilizing the ripple net solution shouldn't they just create their own solution so here's what this void burn said and i thought it was very relevant across the board for this industry uh, imagine if there was one internet per country each with its own isp offering access and each with a different set of available websites so imagine imagine this this scenario now he says how frustrating how frustrating would that be for the for the consumer that would look like uh, now that would look like the current uh, banking system with a plethora of inter-internet bridges to allow someone in a different different region to access services in a different region uh, than theirs at the expense of performance, cost, and user experience. So basically, uh, saying that every uh, ISP, each internet, there's a, a specific internet per each country, and it's you know and you have the walls up around that internet that's only accessible in that country and you have all the websites are only available in that country uh but then you know then how are you going to then access so you're going to have to have a bridge uh between these various uh countries between the various internet solutions um and these various websites their their focus here is stellar are from the other perspective it could be xrp as, as a bridge asset um and so this is where he goes with this that's the, what banking looks like today and what stellar aims to change it asks no money for the technology it offers only to be evaluated used and called upon its shortcomings so that it can work to improve itself the value of such infrastructure is getting the planet together on the same highway lanes so that anyone including visa and my butcher this is this guy uh speaking not me at all uh can offer services and settle their new business seamlessly without costly infrastructure that is prohibit prohibitively expensive for the small business or individual and benefits everyone um so i think this is the guy is so spot on the way he explains it his conversation is relating to stellar you can use it for stellar or you can use it for again you can use it for xrp uh, and the ripple net solution then he goes on here now uh while as far as i'm concerned anyone including visa is welcome to take stellar and make that happen eventually the goal is not to have a hundred different stellar networks obviously you want to have one uh in this regard ibm is ahead of any other willing party by several years and has been doing a fair job of embracing the role of network operator 
Um, and so then he goes on and on and on. Um, and there, there's obviously more involved in, in this conversation, but I think that really, you know, really hits home. And I think it really, you know, states a very important uh, point uh, that, you know, that what's happening with these banks as they try to, to replicate, as they try to create their own, you know, could you imagine at this point uh, that they are in their silo? So the JPM uh, group, whoever that might be, let's say right now it's 200 banks, all utilizing the JP Morgan solution, they're in a silo. They still need to have a bridge currency, a bridge asset to bring them from the JP Morgan group over to the Bank of America group, over to the Bank of England group. Right now, there would be no uh, interconnectivity. And the way he utilized the examples of the, the websites and the ISPs, I thought uh, was right, really spot on. So, you know, I think that that's important. Um, let's see here. Let me go back. Uh, see what we got going on here. I'm just going to go back to some of the notes, see if you guys got any uh, feedback on that. That's the XRP pilot. Uh, welcome. Glad to have you on. If, if everything mooned yet, you've got your jet. You can uh, start flying around the world picking people up. Okay, tap line. Uh, this will not work. Uh, Bank of America coin, JPM coin, uh, PayPal coin will not work. That that's also the uh, you know probably you know very uh, probable outcome is that they can't work, um, and they're very uh, you know they're they're oriented in a in a silo, so they're going to be stuck in their own silo. They're never going to get outside of their own silo, um, and I I think you know especially you know as many have mentioned that even within the JPM uh, network. Uh, not only can it not be used outside, but some have said that you can't even connect it with a, a bridge asset, that it's going to have to then be transferred over uh, into something else. So, you know, I, you know, I don't know, you know, what that would look like. So, and I, and I think that like Miyagi saying, I can't pay my friend directly in India with JPM coin. Exactly. Um, it's, it's not possible. Uh, it's not going to be an open exchangeable network. Um, they also uh, don't have, and this is what is unique about uh, the, the uh, XRP ledger, um, is that instinctively uh, it has an exchange built into the ledger to exchange into any currency. Um, so that's uh, one of the huge pluses uh, that XRP has above any of the others. Um, and so even if, let's say, you could, uh, you know, operate within the JPM network, but in order to move the JPM coins, you're still going to need the bridge asset. Uh, and let's say there was a way to do it. Like I said, some have said, and I don't know, yes or no, uh, that you can't get outside of the JPM network. It's not possible that they're going to have to move it into fiat, then use the bridge asset. So... Jeff, isn't everything going to flow through it eventually? Uh, I think it will. Yeah, I think eventually uh, it's going to have to go over the inner ledger. You know, it just, uh, it seems that that's the direction. Um, that's what they're developing it uh, to be as well. So um, tap line USD to Mexico via XRP works 100%. Um, we can send even XRP tip bot. We can send it anywhere in the world right now. Um, I can send you XRP anywhere, anywhere in the world right now. Um, we obviously want to make uh, the platform a little bit more seamless to send uh, to make it uh, more, uh, you know, account friendly uh, instead of just doing P2P. If we're doing, uh, you know, business transaction to be able to business, build it into um, accounting solutions. Uh, but yeah, it's it's all, you know, I think that that's that's, uh, you know, something that's really important to identify. And I agree with you, you know, it just isn't going to work. And that's really the, the fallacy, the flaw of the JPM uh, solution. And that's also as we go back to, and I, and I started out the conversation focused on this article from Bloomberg that was specifically pointing out that they're working with Accenture and JP Morgan uh, in order to put this project together, uh, Bank of Canada and the Monetary Authority of Singapore uh, to utilize uh, blockchain technology. They're missing the bigger point that even, let's say they're working within this JPM network they're mix, missing the bigger uh picture that now they're stuck just working with each other they're not going to be able to work with 
uh, the Bank of India unless the Bank of India is somehow, you know, uh, going to participate with JP Morgan. But anyone that isn't participating on their network, you're not going to be able to move money to them. And it's you're going you're just uh, you're creating an environment that uh, is very uh, uh, well, let's just say it's not just that it's not flexible, but it's not going to be functional. So let me see here what I, I lost my uh, chat screen. There we go. All right, um, let me move down the list here. Now, if we want to take a step over to uh, a little uh, conversation on regulation, but uh, before we do that, let me uh, let you guys throw up some chats here for a minute. Brian, this was uh, Jameson Caskmate. Really good. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Uh, XRP Hollywood. Uh, so StellarNet has Lumens and Stellar Paycoin. X XRPL has XRP and Alvarcoin. TronNet has TRX and BTT. Yeah, they're all over the place. You know, every A hey, C A K man. Welcome. Glad you made it on. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's the issue. Is that you can't have. And we need to simplify, you know, so as markets expand and develop, um, and I think we see these in other industries as well, you have a lot of different uh, competitive solutions that pop up that may even stay there. Right now, uh, there's different ways to move money uh, between people through different apps. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, not, not the, the best solution, not the easiest solution necessarily. Um, but again, you know, if you have all these different types of coins, how are you going to take right now? How am I going to move XRP? If you need XLM, you don't want to work with XRP, but you want to work with XLM. You don't want to have a hundred different uh, wallets and addresses to worry about. You want to simplify. You don't want to have to transact and exchange. Um, there has to be a, a bridge to transact and exchange. So you want to receive XLMs, let's say, I'm going to send you XRPs that will automatically then be easily converted over to XLM. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's really the way it, it potentially is going to work in the beginning uh, until one begins to dominate. You know, can we say, and, and I brought this up before, uh, we, have, we have the argument between Coke and Pepsi. We have the argument between Burger King and McDonald's. Um, and those have been, you know, ongoing for, for decades. Um, and we might then still see those same types of arguments as we move in uh, to the payment class with digital asset for cross-border payments. It's possible. Um, don't know, um, but we see the, the conflict. We saw Microsoft Apple, and we saw Android Apple, um, and so um, we see you know, some, some changes. Uh, whiskey coin, I love that idea. You know what? We should... Uh, Every time you, if you drink something and you're in a, in a public environment and you mention, you know, Jameson Caskmate, I should get a whiskey coin. That'd be pretty cool, you know? So you're on, you're doing your stream and you just happen to be drinking something. You got your viewing audience, or, you know, if you're, or you're tweeting something out, hey, I've got, uh, you know, Jameson, bing. All of a sudden you get a, uh, a Jameson coin sent to your uh, Jameson wallet. <laughs> That'd be that'd be pretty sweet. Or your whiskey, you know, that'd be that'd be advertising. So that's uh, they don't have to ask me for the advertising. I'm advertising them, and depending on how many people are listening, uh, your micro payments transacted uh, through the uh, XRP ledger, and boom, you know, you can have it transacted over into uh, a whiskey coin that's based on the XRP ledger. Man, what an awesome idea! See that we're thinking. We're thinking of ways to use uh, advertising uh, and AI together. So AI is always listening to what we're saying. Why shouldn't it convert uh, what we're saying into a form of uh, payment uh, and compensation for uh, promoting somebody? I think that'd be awesome. <laughs> so, um, all right, let's see here. Uh, blah, blah. Okay, here we go. XRP Hollywood. I think XRP and XLM is for bridge currency and Alvor is for e-commerce on XRPL. And so is Stellar Paycoin on the Stellar Net. Um, I believe that XRP and XLM uh, will be suited for the bridge currency. Um, and there's a lot of discussion on XLM also being utilized uh, for micro payments, um, especially the primary project of Stellar uh, was to do the outreach uh, to help uh, bank the unbanked. 
uh, for in, in a micropayment uh, sense. Um, so especially in what we were talking about earlier today and the reason why I thought it was so important to look at what's happening and take things to a much different perspective uh, internationally, uh, politically speaking, and then economically, and then drill it down all the way back down to us on the ground. Uh, how are we going to help facilitate the rebuilding of economies in these destitute nations and digital assets, in my opinion, are their way out. Um, it's their way to freedom and it's their way uh, for, for uh, really stepping out uh, from underneath the thumb of many of these you know, oppressive uh, regimes that don't allow them uh, to really develop uh, any form of, uh, of free economy or uh, entrepreneurial growth. Um, and so finding a way for them uh, to even bank themselves, even if it's uh, on, a, on, a, on a more, uh, really on a smaller scale, um, if you know, everyone runs around with their cell phones and someone's selling oranges um, and fiat currencies are no longer valuable and we can just transfer an XRP or an XLM cell phone to cell phone uh, and we're able to help facilitate that growth on, on a micro level, I think that's phenomenal. Um, and now they're being banked uh, through their wallet, uh, which is fantastic. And being able to participate in the global economy. And to me, that's that's freedom. Um, OK, so let's see here, I think. OK, where else do we go? Efficiency, liquidity and number of payment rails is key. I agree with that, too, Miyagi. So that's something that has to be looked at. And that's something that's going to impact uh, the uh, the general uh, mainstream adoption of one of these solutions. So when we we look at even like uh, um, what was it, Betamax and uh, VHS uh, in the 80s, uh, which one won out? It was VHS. There was a battle there. Um, there's always that that battle, but one technology uh, could potentially be better suited uh, for the purpose that you know of what of what it's being uh, used for. Um, and more, you know, adaptable or adoptable. Uh, so, all right. Uh, let's see here. Ah, <laughs> McAllen, nice. I'm glad you poured some scotch on that one. Uh, my my scotch is out, and I'd have to go way over on the other side uh, to get more. So I'm down to a little bit of ice cube. I had the large ice cube, the big round ice cube. Um, if you guys go on to Amazon, get those the big ice cubes. They have the the ice cube molds on like a silicon. And then it turns into you can get the, the round ones, you know, or you can get the large square ones. It's the coolest thing ever. So anyhow. Now I'm just getting thirsty and I and I ran out. So fortunately, I got this water here, too. Uh, tap line. Yeah, XRB and uh, and or uh, BTC is freedom. And, and that's the direction we need to move into. So. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Uh, huh, XRP pilot. You don't look old enough uh, to remember Betamax versus VHS. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that, that's a compliment, I guess. You know, that's I appreciate that. So I do. I do. <laughs> I was around back then. That was a long time ago. So if there's anybody that wasn't, uh, that was uh, way back in the history. Uh, I told my son that in our days, and this is when he was like, three years old, I said, you know what, when I was growing up, we didn't have uh, tablets, we didn't have uh, phones to watch, uh, you know, with with YouTube or anything like that. We didn't have computers. And then he's looking at me like, you know, like, what? You didn't have computers and phones? He said, what did you watch on then? I said, we didn't watch on anything. And he looked at me like, what do you mean you didn't watch anything? How did you get YouTube? And I said, well, there wasn't YouTube. <laughs> I said, what we did was go outside from, uh, from uh, dusk uh, to, to uh, from dawn to dusk, from the moment we could get out the door, we went outside and we didn't come back in until the sunset. <laughs> and that, that's what we did to entertain ourselves uh, other than watching TV. And then I told him, I said, when I was growing up uh, where, I, where I was living, uh, you know, we had initially, we only had one channel and then two channels. Um, and then, it, you know, <laughs> and it's crazy. I can remember even as, as a younger kid, uh, my mother wouldn't even allow us to have a color TV. So we just had the black and white TV and we had the little dial on it. So could you, and I was telling him, I said, we had to get up and actually change the channel. <laughs> Tab <laughs> Tablets were, uh, were pills to swallow. That's right. And mobile phones were just phones with a long cord. And you were lucky 
uh, if you had a long cord, right? And then you had the, the heavier phones. And I, I have some phones here. I had lived in our previous house to here. We had moved in um, and there were two old school uh, black phones. If you remember, if you ever seen those, the black dial phones, super heavy, the kind they would keep next to the door at night. So if anyone came in, you could whack them over the head with it. Um, but the, so it's super heavy and it had the dial. And, and I show it to my son. I'm like, you know, how do you dial this phone? He's looking at it and he's like, man, you had to you imagine you'd go and you'd start dialing the number and you'd make a mistake. You'd be like, oh, damn, you have to hang up. You start dialing over again. Oh, it was <laughs> oh man, those were the days. And then I remember getting the first push button phone, you know, and you get that and you're like, oh, that's the greatest thing ever. You know, and see, you're still you're still caught to your uh, to the cord, and then you had to remember people's phone numbers. You know how awesome was that? Yo, John, what's up? Glad you made it on. Oh, uh, but yeah, that that was crazy. And I can remember, I'm trying to think. Uh, my first uh, cordless phone. I can't remember when that was. Uh, I'm sure we had one. I know we had one in the house at one point. A pager, ha. <laughs> Yeah, I used to have a pager too. And the pagers were awesome too, right? You'd get the pager. I remember having my pager. And then you'd have certain codes that you could plug in. If you flipped them over, you could read different messages on it. You know, if you got the numbers right, you could write like hello or some other things. And then there were certain sequences of digits uh, that meant something. So you could just send someone a message and boom, you'd send them the, uh, the text with that code on it. <laughs> and then, right, then you had to go find a pay phone. That was the best. You're like, where in the world's a payphone? I was telling my son about the payphone. And he's like, a payphone? You know, trying to find a payphone anywhere around here. Forget about that. That's hilarious. Man, those are good times. Yeah, but look at that, you know, running around the fields. Man, those are, I try to explain to my son. I'm like, come on, let's go. You know, you want to go outside, get some sticks. You know, we have a lake behind our house and they, they don't want to know anything about it. They go outside and kick the ball, and then the ball goes in the water. Like, oh, I don't, I don't want to go and get it. I'm like, no, I don't want you to go in the water anyways. Uh, but, um, but you know, there's snakes and other things that could be in there. So, uh, but anyhow, I can remember, you know, growing up, we went outside. We were looking for ant nests. We were looking for centipedes. We were looking for uh, scorpions. You know, we were looking for anything that uh, that could uh, that could bite. You know, <laughs> yo, Auburn Rain, what's up? And I can remember, you know, I don't know, you know, boys, I guess, you know, we got into uh, ridiculous things, you know, I know <laughs> growing up, um, I can remember, uh, what are, I don't know, we'd, we'd get ants and try to fight ants and bees and spiders and centipedes and scorpions and uh, all sorts of ridiculous things. I'm surprised we survived. I don't know how we survived. <laughs> so maybe it's better that the kids are inside just sitting on their tablets. I don't know. <laughs> uh, what's that? Let's see. Uh, five eight zero zero eight on the calculator upside down good times yeah <laughs> yep exactly that's hilarious <laughs> oh man all sorts of memories that's funny running away from beehives man great stuff yo auburn that was great uh that yeah great stream last night man auburn rain everybody if you guys haven't checked out auburn rain yet uh he started streaming I uh, had been streaming, but took over the uh, 10 o'clock spot on Friday nights. Um, so that was awesome. It was great to hear hear your stream, and you know it was a good group that got on. So check them out. You can uh, Cliff, you're on. Just go ahead and uh, you know join his channel if you get a chance. So uh, big slick, what's up? Yeah, man, we had we had scorpions. Uh, we'd catch the scorpions, and then we had centipedes, and these centipedes were ridiculous. So. They're these long ass centipedes and they were the most poisonous. So if you got bit by the centipede, I think you had like uh, 10 minutes to, to live uh, to get to a hospital. So when we'd be out where forget about it, you wouldn't you wouldn't make it back. But it was great. You get the, the centipedes and the scorpions together and, you know, you battle it out. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's what we do as kids. So who knows? That was great. Good times anyways. <laughs> so. All right, look at this. I'm, I'm coming up. That was a fast hour, but um, yeah, I was, uh, you know, kind of in the desert. Yep, it was kind of desert, mountainous area. Um, so there was all sorts of crazy stuff uh, living under rocks. Uh, so, and we, we'd like to flip over rocks for sure as kids. 
and the bees too. I used to like catching bees for some reason. Um, all right. So, but then you try to translate that information over, over to the kids now and they're like, um, hmm, what's on YouTube? <laughs> so for them, you know, doing anything is like uh, pranks and they watch Mr. Beast and they watch all these other guys that are on there. You know, you see the progression of the kids now. They start from Dan TDM and then they move into, I don't know, some other annoying people. Um, and then now it's all about Mr. Beast and, and others. And now it's uh, the Ireland boys. Uh, those guys are cool. Uh, and Mr. Beast, I don't know, I like watching some of those too. When I, when I see him watching them, I'm like, oh, I'll sit here and watch them with you. They're a lot of fun. They're entertaining. So um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, exactly. Climbing trees too. You know, it's insane. The things that we did, I don't know. Uh, all right, so check this out. So this, I think, is important. Now, I want to round all of this conversation out. We're talking about mainstream adoption. We're talking about utility. Um, sorry, my neck is starting to, uh, to hurt. Um, but we were, uh, I was out with the, with the kids. We were doing tennis and stuff earlier. Um, so um, SC, so with, with, the, with everything that we talked about, again, we see what was happening with NASDAQ. We see, you know, really bringing about the mainstream recognition or identification of uh, the crypto space, the digital asset space. Um, then we fast forward and there's a fintech forum taking place on May 31st. Now, this is through the SEC, the U.S. Uh, SEC. Now, we've seen some big movements in Thailand with their SEC and the uh, recognition of securities and the tokenization of securities. Thailand is progressively further ahead uh, than where we are in the U.S., as are many of the other countries. Uh, we're way lagging behind in the U.S. Uh, in this space. But uh, this is this was a press release actually from last month, April 24th, as the SEC announced an agenda for their fintech forum uh, for May 31st. Now, why is this important? It's important because the SEC is pulling together a forum discussing the importance and significance of fintech companies. So as I drilled through their uh, their agenda um, over the, that, the course of that day, I didn't really find anybody that I thought was really that exciting to, to, uh, to mention. Um, there were some lawyers, uh, someone, some uh, financial people on the panelists. So far, I don't see any uh, digital asset people. Um, however, there was Brett uh, Red Firm Director, Division of Trading and Markets from I don't know where. Um, and so then we keep drilling down through the day. I'm like, okay, so we're talking about fintech. And so we have lawyers, we have someone from Ernst and Young. I'm like, you know, I'm trying to figure out what any of these people, what kind of contributions can they make when it comes to fintech? Here's someone from Fidelity Brokerage Services. Uh, and then we get into, uh, what is this? MIT Media Lab. Okay, we're getting a little bit closer. Uh, we keep drilling down. And then we have someone here from uh, Sherman and Sterling, um, potentially accounting or, or other, not sure. It looks like investment management. Um, then we get into Deloitte. Okay, so we keep drilling down through the day. And finally, in panel number four, we have uh, three panelists, two of which I think are important. Um, one is Christopher Ferris from IBM. And the other is Todd McDonald from R3. And then we get into the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. Um, but, but that's it. This is the forum, uh, the FinTech forum. You get a lot of people that are if, working for other companies. Finally, you get to the panel four and you actually see uh, the moderator here, Scott Walker, special counsel of FinHub. Uh, and then you have your panelists. And so finally, uh, panel four, distributor, distributed ledger technology innovations, industry trends, and specific use cases for financial markets. So finally, they round out the rest of the day uh, in panel four. Um, and I think that's awesome. You know, so even though you have all this other stuff in the discussion, finally, at the end, they round it off with someone from IBM and R3, specifically 
uh, to discuss. Uh, and, and obviously, as we know, both of them are working in the cross-border space and R3 uh, working with, uh, with XRP and, and Ripple. So uh, the RippleNet solution in some way, shape or form. So I think that's awesome. You know, so uh, Wharton School. Yeah. Yep. Mm. That's right, Auburn. Uh, he did. I forgot about that. Good point. 2020. Um, let's see here. All right, let's, uh, okay, so let's see. The, the last thing that I wanted to bring up to kind of round this out, I had this all planned out. Could have fit within an hour. Then I had to start talking about rotary dial phones and scorpions and spiders and ants and bees. and <laughs> So uh, anyhow, so let's see here. This is, this is cool. So this was, again, this was a couple days ago. Things move so fast, it's insane. So this was an article that I had found actually on cryptobriefing.com. I wanted to put something uh, out there. Sorry, my, my neck and back are, are killing me for some reason. Uh, okay, so this is uh, crypto regulation in Finland and Russia. Good, bad, and or ugly. Or good, bad, or ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so... So this is really cool because uh, both, according to this article, the way they wrote this, uh, both Russia and Finland have introduced new re uh, new regulations around cryptocurrencies, uh, and and I like what they're saying in this article also because they say it's a sign that digital assets are receiving more recognition. That's 100% accurate. So we see again Russia and Finland making a move uh, in the right direction. Uh, to uh, to provide some form of uh, regulatory or regulation over the space. Now, here's the critical question, especially when you think about uh, the Russian government, or you know, even you know whether it's coming out of Finland. Uh, either way, um, the question, or it could be the U.S. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but here, but is government regulation a sign of adoption or an attempt at control? I think that's an important question because we talk about the need for regulatory clarity. We talk about the need to provide regulation around cryptocurrency. <clears throat> now, it's a, definitely a valid question and a valid concern uh, to consider uh, is a government regulation uh, going to provide uh, more freedom of movement? Is it going to provide uh, further means of adoption? of the technology is it going to help uh, further the growth in the space and the expansion of the technology or is it put in place in order to stifle uh, the growth of the digital asset space uh, and thereby also stifling the growth of blockchain technology in order to uh, control uh, the monetary flow of the populace um, so i think that's important and i believe we've seen that form of implementation in China, uh, when they attempt to shut down uh, Bitcoin mining, um, but they haven't all out come out against uh, digital assets entirely uh, in general. Um, but there is some negative uh, perspective uh, already fermenting uh, at the government level. We definitely saw uh, some negative uh, attention and negative uh, momentum coming out of the governments in India uh, in relation to uh, digital asset and so and that definitely has a had it had not that it will or not that it is it had and is uh, having a significantly detrimental impact uh, on the digital asset space in India as we saw some of their primary uh, exchanges that were forced to shut their doors in India uh, due to the control uh, of regulation that really forbid them uh, to provide a means of exchange. Uh, so that really uh, stifled the business and really stifled uh, the potential and possibilities uh, that were being created at that point. Now, uh, we also then, in all of this stuff that's going on, we saw uh, Saab, uh, S-A-B-B, was it the Saudi Arabian uh, something bank? Oh, I forget what it stands for. It's a part of HSBC. I could be completely off on what that stands for, but um, it's, a, it's a, an affiliate of HSBC. And 
they created a direct rail uh, to India. Um, what was, I forget where it was from. Was that like Singapore to India or wherever it was, whatever the movement was, utilizing uh, RippleNet. Uh, so they're utilizing uh, a blockchain-based technology and they're not using XRapid at this point. Uh, but even if they were, uh, it's not, you, they wouldn't be utilizing XRapid uh, or allowing their, their public to utilize XRP. The XRapid solution would be utilizing a digital asset behind the scenes uh, to where large organizations can quickly move money cheaply, uh, but wouldn't be moving money, or wouldn't be moving through utilizing digital asset directly. Uh, so that could be allowed, but there's still a lot of discussion and conversation. So in India, uh, regulation could, nef could be considered a bad thing uh, as the government in India and the central banks in India are attempting to control the economy of the populace, as we also saw during the same period of time uh, back in, what was it, in October, uh, the Indian government actually uh, began to uh, cut out uh, up to 75% of all held fiat currency and removed it from the marketplace um, in order to force even those on the smaller scale that rely on fiat and can't afford to be in an electronic banking environment, but really pushing the majority of the population into uh, electronic banking, uh, which would, to me, make way for also opening up the possibility of allowing them to utilize digital asset uh, to help uh, bank more of those in the impoverished class, which are around 700 million people uh, in India that need to be banked. So, uh, so that's where you start seeing that relevant question, is government regulation uh, good or bad? So uh, let, me, let me throw back up here, let me see. Uh, we'll round this out here in a little bit. I don't want to go too long, guys, and keep everybody uh, up on 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 the uh, YouTube here. So uh, let's see. Everything's moving forward, and we'll get there when the crackpots in D.C. move out of the way. Agree uh, with that, Rain. Uh, the, the countries that do not adopt will fall behind 100%. I agree with that. Uh, Miyagi, uh, what's good about this tech is that the global... Uh, that it's global, just finding the right location uh, that has regs to help grow the space uh, like Malta. Exactly. That's such a great point uh, that if you don't, uh, you're either going to, you're either going to join or you're going to, or you're going to drop out and you're going to fall behind and the companies uh, will move to and really like magnets be attracted uh, to those countries that provide uh, that type of regulation, positive regulation, to help uh, build and develop the technology into the space. I couldn't agree more with that. Um, and then, uh, let's see, Brian, doesn't Christine Lagarde say uh, that uh, banks will have to adopt or die? Um, I think banks do have to adopt or die. The question is uh, exactly what. Um, I think, I do believe that as we transition from our perspective, uh, banks are already on notice because we, we've talked about uh, in, in previous streams how, uh, how the exchanges were seeing a blurring of the lines. And we talked about this on Thursday night as well, a blurring of the lines between the exchanges and banking. Uh, banks are going to have a lot more difficulty moving over uh, to accept digital assets than it would be for a digital asset exchange to then become a bank and do online banking only. Uh, because Uphold right now could potentially do it. They could potentially be a bank. Um, and there's other entities that are being plugged in uh, that can also then uh, provide you interest um, on the money held. But with Uphold, you can send US dollars. I could hold Euro. I could hold uh, any African coin, whatever African country. I can use any Latin American country. I could hold whatever uh, denomination I want uh, on Uphold, I can just transmit and buy it and hold it there. So if for all intents and purposes, that's quasi-banking. Um, now, in a, in a banking environment, you want to make sure that you're FDIC insured so that your money held is protected in case something happens to the bank, that it's backed up uh, in some form. And that's where you begin to rely a little bit um, on government entity. Uh, if you are keeping your money uh, in an external exchange and you're not controlling uh, your own digital asset on a, a Nano S, let's say, but you're putting the trust in another entity, 
in order for them to have that trust, there has to be a bigger organization that's ensuring the trust as well. Um, and so there's a lot more that goes into it, but banks move so slow and are going to have a much more difficult time uh, moving into the digital asset space again than I believe these digital asset companies are going to have as they migrate into banks. And the amounts of money that a Binance has or a Coinbase has is staggering. The amount of money that they're transacting right now, the amount of profit that they're generating is beyond uh, what many of these smaller banks could ever imagine doing. So in essence, it also allows for these big uh, exchanges to easily buy out uh, banks and absorb them into uh, what they're already doing. Whereas some of these large exchanges like a Coinbase, <clears throat> a Bitstamp or a, uh, or a Binance might already be too large. And I think Bitstamp was bought out, I, I believe, or Bitstamp bought someone out. Um, I can't remember, uh, but, but that's, that's the dynamic um, that I think we're looking at. And that's where we're going to start seeing, I believe, as we go into 2020, uh, that's when we're going to start seeing some true uh, merging of, of the banking exchange uh, type thing. Uh, so that, that'll be interesting. Salsa, Real, uh, SA, British Bank. Oh, okay, let me, uh, so XRP Pilot, when you post that up again, I'll, I'll check it out. Uh, where did we leave off here? Okay, um, I know most people don't want to move uh, just as the government fears on losing its citizens. I agree with that too. A lot of people don't, but businesses, on the other hand, will move uh, if they feel that that's what's uh, in their financial interest. Many won't, many you know, will still try to find a way around it, uh, but if they're mobile uh, and they can pick up and go, they're gonna pick up and go, similar to the way Binance did. Uh, let's see, Rain, XRP, <clears throat> sorry, XRP and the RippleNet will be mass adopted. Yep, uh, and Miyagi says, because you'll have wealthy entrepreneurs and companies leaving, uh, to countries that will incentivize a space that that's what's going to motivate them and people will get up and will move because of that um and so yep uh, so sr sa british bank um all right so 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 again you know i think this was really relevant this article again from crypto briefing talking about russia and finland um they did talk about four areas in russia but let me see just to, to summarize so we can move on uh in a bill drafted by the economy ministry the sandbox trials will be state monitored and users of crypto cryptocurrencies will be immune from prosecution for working with crypto that's crazy right um uh, let me read that again <laughs> this is in russia uh this is an initiative to test cryptocurrencies now would you want to enter into a sandbox trial where the trials are a monitored uh, by the government and the users for that period of time will be immune from prosecution from working with for working with crypto um no you know what i have a problem with that i don't think that i would participate because the government at any point in time could say you know what we're shutting it down okay well now you shut it down you're not you running this program anymore. I'm tied up in this in this market. I need to get out. Oh, sorry, you're a day late. Uh, now you're uh, you're no longer immune from prosecution, and we're coming after you because we want to make a point. Um, I don't think that that's a, a good way of uh, going about it. Honestly, I'd be a little nervous. It says here uh, the move has been touted as a major advancement in mainstream adoption for Russia. So whatever it takes, though, I think it's it's good because there will be people that will do it. Um, I'm not in Russia, from Russia. So it's hard for me to say as an outsider, you know, what I'd be or wouldn't be comfortable with. I'm sure there's plenty that will jump in on that opportunity. A country that appears to be warming to the use of virtual currencies within its borders. Uh, and the, it, like the article said here, as I just said, it's ostensibly uh, positive as Russia has been at varying, time, varying times hostile uh, and inconsistent. So I would still be very concerned myself personally coming from my perspective of even getting involved but you can see where the country the the government at a gov from a government level is still extremely uncertain about relinquishing any form of monetary control china india 
of uh, three major and Russia, three major countries that are are very uh, uh, you know um, uh, uh, concerned about allowing the the public. Uh, to have some free, freedom of movement, uh, economically speaking, that they can't tax and monitor uh, on a regular basis easily, um, and so, so that that's definitely concerning. But at least, at least these countries are coming out one way or the other. Whereas the U.S., uh, you know, re from a regulation perspective, everything's slow. You know, but but that's also good. You know, we don't want the government to move too fast and make you know uh, decisions that are not rational. Um, I think that sometimes decisions like this need to be digested and they need to look at all aspects of it. At the same time, the SEC could be dragging their feet because many times the government is, uh, is susceptible to the lobbying efforts of larger entities. And in this case, uh, government and the Congress people could be very susceptible to lobbying from large financial organizations and large banks saying, hey, you know what, we control this, 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 and this. Uh, this is where your money flow is from. That money flow, that spigot's going to shut off if you don't slow down uh, and, and take a back seat on making any decisions. Or, hey, now's the time. You're going to make a decision tomorrow uh, because we're going to shut your spigot off now that you don't make a decision. Uh, so I think there's a lot of other uh, extenuating circumstances when it comes to uh, how the government mindset might, might work. But um, so... Where are we? Oh man, it's already uh, nine, uh, 10 22. So, uh, man, I'm really glad all you guys uh, joined in and held in here uh, as we as we went through this uh, this discussion. I uh, really appreciate everybody's time being on. I didn't want to go more than an hour, uh, but uh, obviously there was a, a ton of great stuff to talk about. So there's a lot more in that article. I think uh, maybe maybe just uh, just one more note on it regarding. Uh, Finland, because I think Finland, uh, it says here, um, the Financial Supervisory Authority informed the media that the Nordic country would enact the act on virtual currency providers from May 1st, so it was enacted. The law makes FinFSA the regulator for cryptocurrencies in the country, and here it says, the new legislation is aimed at money laundering and combating terrorism, which we saw a similar uh, type of... Uh, uh, law uh, act that passed through the U.S. Congress back in January. Actually, two of them focused specifically on money laundering and combating terrorism. So, so that's interesting. Uh, but it's not clear how they will interface with existing taxation laws, similar to in the U.S. Um, tax authority established taxes of 30 percent on any crypto transaction. That that's a very very uh, uh, high uh, tax rate. And we have to understand, I guess, a little more about what that transaction is. We'll have to read a little bit more on it uh, later. But we can see at least they're they're moving in a direction uh, to where they're trying to uh, do something uh, positive. It said the FTA law saw a drop in crypto activity as it effectively rendered dealing in crypto, crypto unviable. Um, so that's not a good thing. <laughs> so... Um, I don't like the the tax, um, but at least they're talking about it and moving it forward. But this was this was old, so this was from July of 2018. The ruling um, on the taxes, so they don't know what's going to change on that. Obviously, that needs to change and adjust and start seeing some uh, some space open up in Finland. This article goes on and on and on, gets more in depth into it. We won't go through all the all the the minor uh, details. There's, you can check it out. Let me see. I thought it's an interesting article anyways. Let me just throw this in the chat. Uh, you guys can check it out. Um, I think it's it's a good read uh, when it comes to, uh, where'd my chat window go? When it comes to regulation. So let me throw this in there. Boom, there we go. There you go. All right. So let's see where we're at here. Um, Brian, man, yeah, I, th I really thank all of you guys for uh, for being on. Crash Monkey, what's up, man? Uh, Crash Monkey's glad to see you on. Man, I've been looking out for more of your videos. Man, I was loving your workout videos. Uh, those are great. Uh, so Miyagi, let's see, seems like 2019, the year of regulation, fueled by the anti-terrorism aspect. That, from a government perspective, their biggest concern and, and you know, maybe lack of knowledge in the space also, but again concern is the is the circumvention uh being able to utilize digital asset for money laundering and for terrorism supporting of terrorists so 
Um, obviously, right now, terrorism is supported through fiat currency and trans. It's going to happen one way or the other um, through uh, digital asset, through the blockchain. Obviously, it's a lot more traceable uh, than is a fiat or, you know, or, or others. So, you know, so that so that's interesting. But anyhow, uh, let me wrap it up tonight. Monday night, we'll be back on uh, another live stream. Uh, Monday, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, I'm going to have Digital Nomad Investor on with me. We're going to do a deeper dive into a lot of uh, these uh, topics when it comes to uh, international politics, the economics of the digital asset space, and you know what it what it's really going to mean for mainstream adoption. So I think that's going to be awesome, man. Crash Monkeys, let me know. You know, definitely post those up. I'll look forward to seeing them. Um, and so awesome. If you guys haven't checked it out, Crash Monkeys has an amazing story. Um, you can go through, watch his videos if you check out his channel. Um, but he's got an amazing story on uh, getting into it and uh, helps out. So uh, I think that'd be great, you know, for you guys to, to watch. Very inspirational. So anyhow, again, I totally appreciate all you guys for being on tonight. I look forward to seeing you guys on Monday night. Um, until that time, uh, keep on hodling your crypto i'll check you guys out later i'm going through i might have missed some of the things up in the stream but <laughs> anyhow all right i'll check you guys out thanks